living an inheritance and legacy. I combine the two words just to see what God can give us out of this book of Proverbs 13 and verses number 22. And I'm praying that after this service, God will have spoken to somebody. Because every time God sends his word, he has a purpose why that word comes. And I believe this morning, this message is for all of us in one way or another. I was trying to look at the meaning of inheritance and the meaning of legacy. Try to look at this meaning in the dictionary just to, to, to have a clear picture of what I'll be sharing in the name of Jesus. And as I looked at the word inheritance, inheritance refers to something that is or may be inherited. This may include money, property, or any possession that comes to somebody who inherits. It also relates to the reception of generic qualities by transmissions from parents to their offspring. This determines the traits and the characteristic past down through generation to generation. It can also refer to cultural heritage such as traditions, knowledge, artistic achievements, and things like those. Inheritance can also be taught from one generation to another. And we are told it can be tangible or intangible. And I'll be combining the two. The things that you can touch and the things that you cannot touch as you pass on something to the next generation. Then inheritance shapes how our lives looks like as we live in this planet Earth. The second definition is on legacy. I'm defining this thing so that as I'm talking, already we know where we are going and where we are coming from. Legacy refers to something that is passed down from one generation to another. It can be financial legacy. It can be cultural legacy. It can be spiritual legacy. And one thing we need to note is that legacy extends beyond mere possessions. It goes beyond what we can see, things that are tangible. It goes beyond that. It encompasses the enduring impact of events, idea, and actions. And that's why I want to say, children of God, it is good to know that we have both good and bad legacy. And when we talk about legacy, we are talking about the life that we live now and when we are gone. That is very, very important. Now let us go to our scripture of the day. The book of Proverbs chapter 13 and verses 22. I'll read from three translation for us just to see what this scripture is saying. The Bible says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. That is English standard version. If you read New Living Translation, the Bible says, good people, and I know there are good people in this service this morning. If you're a good person, say amen. Good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren, but the sinner's wealth passes to the godly. And the message translation really blessed my heart. The Bible says, a good life gets passed on to the grandchildren. Ill-gotten wealth ends up with good people. When you look at this portion of the scripture, there are things that come into your mind. There's a contrast between the good and the bad. There's a contrast between the good and the sinner. And if you look at the book of Job 27 verses 16, 
and 17. The Bible says, even if they make a lot of money and are resplendent in the latest, latest fashion, it is the good who will end up wearing the clothes and decent who will divide up the money. That is Job 27 verse 16 and 17. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verses 26. The Bible say, Old may give wisdom and knowledge and joy to his favorites, but sinners are assigned a life of hard labor and end up turning their wages over to God's favorites. Nothing but smoke and spitting in the wind. A contrast between the good and the bad. And I was looking at these two terms. When we talk about a good person, what do we really mean? A good person ensures that their descendants are provided for by leaving an inheritance. Any good person... And you'll be seeing the contrast as we build on our, our, our teaching or preaching this morning. A good person should pass down material wealth, property, and even blessing to the generation that is coming. A good person legacy benefits not just one generation, but a multitude of generations. But if you look at the bad part of it, a sinner always rejects the values and the godliness that comes with, with what God wants them to do. A sinner's wealth will eventually benefit the righteous. And this is a sad story. There's something called divine providence. And the Bible speaks what it means. When the Bible says the sinner's wealth will be transferred to the godly, that is what the Bible says. I cannot explain that, but there's something called divine providence. So as we talk about inheritance, as we talk about legacy, the main thing we need to ask ourselves, how is my life as an individual? Because it is good to have all these other things. But if we reject the virtues, we reject the godliness, we are missing something very important in this journey of passing down something special to the next generation. My brothers and sisters, I want to say that life is too precious to waste. Somebody say amen. This life we have been given is too precious to waste. You must be good to live an inheritance. You'll agree with me. We have seen people who have accumulated wealth. We have seen people who have powerful things. But the moment they are gone, you wonder if this person was living or not living. Even the name disappeared from the mind of people because probably they missed something very, very important. And please get me right as I bring this message to us. I know I'm speaking to parents and parents to be in the future. As a parent, you need to have the right goals in life if you are going to live an inheritance. We live in a world where everybody wants to succeed in life, which is a good thing. As Pastor Ibrahim, I want to succeed in life. You also want to succeed in life. But the big problem is that there are people who succeed in things that does not really matter. And that's a sad story. That there are people who succeed in things that does not really matter. And I want to encourage you in the name of Jesus. We believe God encourages hard work. And people must work very hard. But in your working hard, you must also make sure that you succeed in what really matters. Because that is what will change the generation that is coming. If you agree with me, say amen. There's this man called El Moody. Some of you have read his books. This man has said something that I've quoted here this morning. Our greatest fear in this life should not be failure because we keep failing every other time. You start something, 
you fail. But our greatest fear should be succeeding at something that does not really matter. That's a dangerous thing. If you are succeeding in something that does not really matter, that is a serious thing for a child of God. That you spend all your time, you spend all energy pursuing whatever you are pursuing in the expense of the generation to come. You don't have time to pray for your children. You don't have time to do Bible study with your children. You don't have time to bring your family to church. It is a dangerous thing, child of God. If we fail to do that which is matter, which matters as we pursue what we think is very, very important for this life and even life to come. I was trying to look at what is true success. And I was blessed with a quote from one of the servant of God. And this touched me a lot. He says, this is Peter, true success is becoming all that God wants you to be and doing all that God wants you to do and hearing him say, well done, good and faithful servant. That at the end of the journey, when the time will come, the father will look at you he will see how you have uh, taken care of the things he had given you and how you passed on what he wanted you to pass on to the next generation. And you stand there and you are told, well done, good and faithful servant. This is something I'm praying even as Pastor Ibrahim. This journey has a lot of issues, but I'm praying when my time comes, when I'm going to meet with the Father, when I'm going to see the Father, the father will tell me, well done, good and faithful servant. Looking at this statement, you see the aspect of character, the aspect of doing good, what God wants us to do. And many times as Christians, we need to ask ourselves, whatever I'm pursuing in this life, does God want me to pursue it? Because not everything is designed for you. There are things that God has designed for you. There are things that God has designed for somebody else. But many a times, you find you are doing something that peradventure is not in your lane. When you know that this is what God wants you to do, you'll do it with all your heart. And many times, whatever you do, as a child of God, be always sensitive. Have the spiritual ear. To hear how God is saying, how God commends you in whatever you are doing as a child of God. Somebody say amen. Money and wealth and possession without God becomes poison. And that is my point of, of, of deliberation this morning. I don't say there's anything wrong with money. I don't say there's anything wrong with wealth. I don't say there's anything wrong with possession. But if you have wealth, you have money, you have possession, without God, that becomes a poison. Spiritual blessing is not automatic. And that is why parents should take seriously the issue of leaving godly inheritance to their children. You can have everything. You can have the office. You can have the possession. You can have the wealth. But when it comes to the matter of transferring things to the next generation, you must take it seriously as a child of God. Somebody say amen. I was looking at a classic example from the Bible. We all know the story of Eli the priest. Eli was a pastor like Pastor Ibrahim. And Eli had children. And these children served in the altar. And the saddest part in that story is that Eli the pastor did not pass an inheritance to his children. He only passed an office to his children. And that's something very serious. You can pass an office to your children, but you don't pass an, in, uh, an inheritance to your children. Our mission is very clear to know God and to make him known. If we can do that graciously, then we are doing the right thing. Somebody say amen. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible says, Each year Elkanah will travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of heaven, Sami, at the tabernacle. The priests of the Lord at that time were the two sons of Eli, that is Ophini and Phineas. 
And it is sad that Eli passed on the office of the priest to his sons and not the legacy. It is sad. There are moments we can pass well through our children, which is good. There are moments we can pass possession into our, into our children, which is good. But there's more to that. If you are truly thinking of leaving a legacy to your grandchildren. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 12. When I was reading this scripture, just told God help me. That as I'm thinking about passing an inheritance, I know what I'm passing to the next generation. The Bible says in the New Living Translation, now the sons of Eli were scrondress who had no respect for the Lord or their duties as priests. New King James Version says, now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Yes, they had the office. Yes, they were given an office, but they didn't know the Lord. My brothers, my sisters who are here this morning, it is very, very important. As we work hard every other time, as we do everything we are doing pertaining to this life, we should not forget to pass a godly inheritance to the upcoming generation. Somebody say amen. If you look at the world we are living today, a lot of things are happening. We talk of premarital sex. We talk of teenagers getting pregnant. We talk of HIV and AIDS just rampant in our nation. We talk of corruption. The wealth we have, the properties we have, the monies we have. How have they come into our hands? We talk of those things. We talk of nepotism, tribalism. Our children are growing up and they know you should not talk with this tribe and that tribe. When you are gone, how will that generation look like? That's what I'm trying to say, child of God, this morning in Jesus' name. Eli's son are a classic example of many religious people who do not know the Lord. It is serious to be a religious man. You do everything religiously. You can come to church. You can pay your tithe. You can do everything in the church. But you don't have that one-on-one -on -one connection with your Lord. You can be very religious, but you don't know the Lord. And let me say this. Our children are watching. Our grandchildren are watching. And when we are long gone, people will be wondering, was this man living? Was this family living? Because there's no inheritance that you're leaving behind. I have this few questions to ask you. What do people think of when they think of you as a child of God? What is the legacy that probably you got from your parents? Is there something your parents gave you? I thank God for my parents. They were not very rich. They were just middle class people. But one thing I appreciate God for my parents. They left me with Jesus. And I'm seeing pushing with Jesus. And I thank God that their grandchildren also love Jesus. It's a blessing. Maybe I didn't get any material thing that I can say. This is what they left for me. But they left me Jesus. What legacy do you want to leave behind as a child of God? What are you saying when it is done? This is what I want to give all to. To make sure as I make this money, as I look for this possession, as I look for this wealth, my children should also know God, somebody say amen. What do you want to be remembered for as a child of God? Because the truth of the matter, we are all going to die at some point. We are not here forever. Even with the, with the struggles we have, the hard working we are doing, we are not here forever. Time comes that we are going back to heaven. But what do you want to be remembered for? I've come to challenge somebody today. It is time to prepare a legacy. It is time to tell God, I want to leave a legacy for the next generation. Somebody say amen. When you die, my brothers and sisters, what will your family say about you? Many times we go to funerals. 
When somebody dies, you hear what people say, this is a good man, this was a man like this. Those are good things we say. But the, the question probably in that coffin, somebody should be asking if that person can ask anything. What will God say about me when I'm dead? Because people can say so many things. And there are people who can say, this man was useless. This man was nothing. But what will God say about you? Are you that servant? When you die and now you're appearing at the gate of heaven, God stands and says, welcome, well done, faithful servant. Will you be that fellow? Because that is something we need to ask ourselves all the time. And I was just thinking loud, what will be written in my obituary when I go? What will be written in your obituary when you go? And I read some few scriptures here that probably will open our eyes to see what God is teaching us this morning. In the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 20, the Bible says, Jehoram was 32 years old, a very young person. Prime age, when he became a king. You know, to be a king in those days, meant a lot. It's, it's like becoming a CS, a permanent secretary, a general manager somewhere, even a governor, or somebody big. And the Bible says, this man reigned in Jerusalem eight good years. So I want to believe for the eight good years, this man of God accumulated a lot. But the sad part is, is in the part B of the, the scripture. When this man died, no one was sorrow. It's a serious thing. After becoming a king for good eight years, I know he amassed wealth, he amassed possession, but there was no legacy probably this man left. And because no one was sorry about that, even where I was buried, a king is buried in a, just a normal place. You know, there's a way when somebody dies who is a big person, is given that respect as a big man. But the Bible says they buried him in the city of David but not in the royal cemetery. Why? This man did not leave a legacy behind. This man did not leave an inheritance behind. But I thank God for this man in the book of Acts chapter 13, verses 22 to, 20 to 36. Just two verses. You all know about this man called David. The Bible says, but God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found a man, David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. God is always serious with us doing what he wants us to do. And the Bible says here, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. As he's pursuing whatever he's pursuing, he will do everything I want him to do in his generation. No wonder in verses 36, the Bible says, after David had done the will of God in his generation, he died and was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. After he did everything God wanted him to do, in his generation, the Bible says he died and he was buried. My question this morning is this. What are we leaving to our children? What are we leaving to our grandchildren? It is true. We are working hard, which is very good. It is good to work hard. But what are we leaving to our children? Your children are watching. You are a father who wakes up very early in the morning. You come very late in the night. No time for prayer. No time for reading the Bible. No time for telling your children that there's a God in heaven. Yes, they see you making money. They see you making wealth. But I'm asking this. Are you that man who is saying, I will do everything the Lord wants me to do? Somebody say amen. Friends, I say this with all humility. A mistake is never final. You can do a mistake today. But that is never final. 
We can still serve God in our generation and pass on a godly virtue to the next generation. It is very much possible. Maybe we have not been doing it, but that is not final. We can arise and say, God, in my generation, I want to live a different life. There's this man called Alfred Nobel. I've quoted him here also. He said something very, very powerful. Every man have to have the chance to correct his obituary and write a new one. And I've come to encourage us in this congregation. We can correct. We have a chance. Our God is a God of a second chance. You'll say, even as I get this money, as I get these possessions, as I get this wealth, I want God factor in everything that I'm doing. My children should know that these things come by this way. Teach them how to give tithe in the church. Teach them how to give offering in the church. Teach them how to do clean business, clean deals, because you are living a legacy. They will know whatever wealth we have, that he did not steal anywhere, that he worked hard and he achieved this. That's why we have what we have today. Somebody say amen. John 17 verses 3. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. This is the only way to eternal life, to know him. The sons of Eli got an office of being priests, but these people didn't know the Lord. It's a serious thing. You can have it. But if you don't know the Lord, you're missing something very important in your life. Today, many are working hard to leave money and possession to their grandchildren. Nothing wrong with that. We encourage hard work. Kenya is a hardworking nation. And that is something to thank God for. But if that is the only focus, you and your generation is doomed for failure. If the only focus is money, which money is good because money answers everything. If the only focus is wealth, that you don't have time for God. You don't even have time to go to a mountain and seek God who gives you ability to make that wealth. You don't have time to pray. I tell you, child of God, because the truth of the matter, and this is something many people don't want to listen. A time comes when all of us we are going to say bye-bye. When the reality hits, how will the people behind you live and behave as children of God? You can even decide, say, this time I know I should be this place for connecting with my God. But many times as Christians, I know we only come to church on Sunday. In the course of the week, we are busy, which is very good. We don't come for prayer meetings. We don't do this and that. And sometimes we, we miss something so critical. But for children of God who want to live a legacy for God, we can reach a place like Paul and say, for me, living means living for Christ. And dying is even better. When you live for Christ, when you do anything for Christ, that becomes a blessing. Psalms 27 verses 4. The one thing I ask of the Lord the thing I seek most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. Listen to me, my brothers and sisters. As we are doing everything that we are doing, can we think about God? Can we think about God? Because that's the only way we are going to live a, a legacy. We are going to live an inheritance for the generation that is coming. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. I finish with these three things. If you are to leave an inheritance to your generation, you need to be generous. Generosity is a mark of a godly person. If you are going to leave an inheritance, Please be generous. As a father, be generous with your time. As a mother, be generous with molding those young babies you are still raising at this particular time. Be generous with your availability. Don't be that absent father, absent mother. If you are going to leave an inheritance 
to the coming generation. The children want to see when my father left in the morning, when he comes back in the evening, what does he do? Does he thank God when he comes back in the house? Does he pray? Or he just comes and goes on with other business as usual. You need to be generous as a child of God. Generous with the things that God has given you. Allow your children to know that my father is where he is because of generosity. There are people who are too mean. Too mean. Now we leave these things. Allow our people to know that we are generous. I'm here because of generosity. God has blessed me. I have, I have money. I have wealth. I have possession. But because I know I am here for a purpose and for a reason, I continue generously extend that to the next generation. Somebody say amen. What I say is this. Please let us be generous. With your time, with your wealth, with your possession, be generous. Hizi vitu ni vya dunia bwana. Tutaacha. Hata tukichukua Kenya mzima, we'll still leave them at some point. We need to be generous and say I want to teach my children the power of together and generosity. You tell them my child, my children, there's a generation that is coming after me. There are people who want to build a church for. Let's do this and they see you doing it graciously. I tell you, that is something that will not leave your children when they are grown up. Somebody say amen. We need to be generous. We must be faithful, children of God. I was looking at that scripture, Matthew 25, 21. Well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant. That scripture always hits me. That what will God say when my time comes? We live find faithfulness in my life. But I want to challenge you in the name of Jesus. If you are going to live an inheritance, you must be faithful. Yes, we might have failed in one way or another one. But there's always a second chance of telling God, I want to be faithful. When my time comes, when my moment comes, God, I want to, to, to be found faithful. Do you read the Bible with your children? Do you pray with your children? How is your family altar? Are you faithful to that altar at home? Or it is just business as usual? As long as you wake up, mama goes to work, baba goes to work, we don't bother much. As long as money is coming, we don't care. But I want to tell you, you need to be faithful even to that altar in that family where God has raised you where God is working things on your behalf. You need to be faithful to that altar. If you have agreed, we'll be praying in this family. We'll be worshiping in this family. Do that as a family. And I tell you as you're doing that, there's a generation that is watching. There's a generation that is looking upon you and a time when you cannot see very well. They will say, I thank God. I have a people that still love God. Somebody say amen. People who still love God. You know, I pity Pastor Eli. Imagine you have been in the ministry for all those years, preaching and teaching, and then you are old, you cannot see, you cannot hear very well. You are told the things your sons who are now the priests in the altar are doing. It is a sad story for us as children of God, that the only thing we can pass is what we have and not the godly inheritance. We miss it at that point. And lastly, we must have a bigger picture view Let's not just look for 20 years from now. Let us look for eternity. Where we are going. Where God has gone ahead through his son to prepare a place for us. Let's have that bigger picture and ask yourself, how will Eldoret in 30 years coming look like? And if we have that bigger picture, you'll realize maybe in 30 years, Eldoret will be a powerful city probably in this nation. And this church might be even be too small for the congregation we are thinking about. And when you have a bigger picture view of what you are doing, you'll always want to leave an inheritance that will overleave you. Somebody say amen. Something that will live over you, if that is a good English. I'm saying this. If you're going to leave an inheritance, you must be generous. You must be faithful. 
And you must have that long-term, big-picture view of where you are going. Because there's a generation that is coming after you. Your children are going to get children. And your children's children are going to get children. And if we don't lay a good foundation now, if we don't have that picture now, maybe we might lose a generation along the way. But I've come to encourage you. Can we just believe in this God who is able to put things aright again? Somebody say amen. We should live in a way that benefits not ourselves, but also our children, children. And I want us to read this scripture as I bring this message to a conclusion. And pick some few points there. If you go with me in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 7 to 17. Then we pick some few things there, then we pray together in the name of Jesus. Philippians chapter 3. From verses 7 to 17. And please follow as I read. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Verse 7 says, I once thought these things were valuable. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. This is a man of God who has sat down who has meditated upon what God is doing in his, in his life, and he comes with this statement, and he says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul is saying, I count all these things garbage. And by the way, sometimes they are garbage. If you put your heart there, unaweza kuisha tu bure. But when you have Christ, if anything happens today and you have Christ, you'll still be strong in the Lord. Somebody say amen. Anything can happen. We have been seeing these things. Juzi muliona kule nisiyo kima wama wapi. Mtu wa meweka gorofa nzuri. Bulldozer na kuja tu pole pole. If you don't have Jesus, by the way, you just die because of pressure and other things. So Paul is saying, it is not bad to have those things, but you need not to hold on those things. Those are things of this world. We need to have them, but let them not take the place of God in you. Allow God to take the preeminence in whatever you have. Somebody say amen. So that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness. Through obeying the law, I become righteous through faith in Christ Jesus. For God's way... Of making us right with himself depends on faith. Depends on faith. We must have faith in God. We must believe in God. In the things that we are doing, we must have faith in God. Verse 10. I want you to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. So that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Paul knows very well, a time is coming, he's going to die. But also behind his mind, he knows that there are people who are going to be resurrected. And he wants to be part of that group that will be resurrected to meet with Jesus Christ. He's seeing, he's having that big picture view. He's seeing eternity ahead of him. Verses 12. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things, or that I've already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection, for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. Verses 13. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, 
forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling me. Verses 15. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some points, I believe God will make it plain to you. Verse 16. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. And then he says in verse 17, a very dear scripture to me. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. Learn from those who follow our example. Our children should learn from us. Our grandchildren should learn from us. And when they learn from us, I assure you, things are going to be different. Somebody say amen. So even as we work hard to make sure that we leave some material blessing to our generation, as we work hard making sure that we leave some inheritance in terms of um, physical things to our people, let us also work hard to make sure that we pass a godly, genera- a godly inheritance to our generation. Somebody say amen. Our ultimate inheritance lies in the kingdom of God. Something called eternal life. And this is something we should always be yearning for. This is something we should always be praying for. In whatever we are doing. In that business. See the eternal life 